Hey, uh, welcome everyone. I just arrived. I was speaking in uh, Istanbul yesterday, and uh, I haven't experienced much of Athens yet. Uh, but to get started on this, I was invited to give this talk a few months ago, and I usually give talks in very much more, I would say, hands-on technical places and workshops of TensorFlow and other things. But I've been working with uh, software development and machine learning development and life cycles and management team for quite some time. So I thought it was a good idea to come here and share a little bit and learn a lot from you. To give some context, first, like as she said, my name is Tiago. As you can imagine, I'm probably Portuguese or Brazilian, so I'm Brazilian originally. I left a long time ago, Brazil, to live in other countries. And I've been in the Netherlands for now almost five years. I work for this company called Linkit, and I'm the head of solutions engineering there, means that I manage a team of uh, now 72 uh, software engineers. We don't have POs and scrum masters and PMPs and PMIs and all of it, not because I don't trust you, but mainly because uh, we work directly with clients and we prefer to have the PO and all the stuff coming directly from clients to work with us than us telling them what to do. We prefer to keep that communication close by with the client instead of, hey, this is what you should do. No, we work together. Uh, I studied theoretical math at university. So when I came here and I arrived, I saw all the Greek letters I was felt at home. Uh, it was really, really nice to see things. And I have been working at a, as a software engineer for now for 10 years. And I've worked in very, very different places from cloud to on-premise, machine learning to system engineers, data. I probably failed in everything that you can imagine. And I'm a very community person driven, meaning that I'm all about open source stuff, free software, open software. I organize DevOps days Amsterdam, and I speak at other DevOps days all over the world. I organize Amsterdam AI, and it's something that I really, really like. But in the end, I'm a techie by heart. Even though I'm a team lead and I come back to techie and I do a lot of strategy for it for the, for the company now, because Lincoln now has a big presence in the Netherlands. Besides my team, we have almost 1,000 engineers working in different clients and I'm responsible for the main part of it. So I have to think about strategy now and I code less than I would want, I think. And I would like to talk about AI and please, one thing, if you have questions or you want to comment, don't need to wait until the answer of it, until, until the end of it. Just raise your hand, let's make this a <coughs> chat. Uh, I want to share this quote by Alan Turing in the 50s. Um, Alan Turing thought that by 1950 that AI would be so ubiquitous and machines would be so smart that this is what would happen in a few years. And we are 70 years almost ahead of this and we still have problems in doing autofill of emails and web pages. Uh, we also had other people at the same time, like John von Neumann, a specialist in quality control. All stable process, we shall predict. All stable, we shall control. Uh, I don't think so. New and Simon, 1958, will prove a new mathematical theorem automatically with a computer. Hasn't happened yet. So all of this was in the beginning of the AI hype. All the things that start with it, all the first Bell Labs, all the first IBMs, all the first projects coming with it. And we had the AI winter. Some people thought that AI was something that was never going to happen, all of it. In the 80s, AI was just a term for the Terminator and things like it. And we're now in the middle of the big hype cycle. When I did my master on machine learning 10 years ago, we didn't have deep learning yet. It was just starting, we still had some things. We didn't have the image recognition or voice recognition or any of the stuff that are happening now. And since I'm in a agile conference and all of it, I decided, okay, let's take the last Gartner uh, hype cycle for deep learning and see what Gartner thinks. Gartner thinks we are in the peak of inflated expectations. It means that everybody thinks about AI, what it can do is a lot more than what it actually does. For me, that makes a lot of sense. Because when I talk to clients, 
they usually come to Mila with something like this. Ooh, this seems fancy. Can I also use this and have like a press release or communicate to my stakeholders that we are an AI company or something like that? This expectation without actually knowing just by reading that Google is using and Uber is using and Amazon is using and it's going to take all of, all, of, all of people's jobs and all of it, this brings that into the context. Then you start to go into that buzzword bingo thing where people start to ask, wait, can you also do that in a container and use blockchain? And then the ultimate person comes along into it and comes with the vomit of buzzwords that you can think about it. AI, DevOps, Cloud Native, Kubernetes, blockchain, and end up with digital transformation. Like, what the hell does that mean? Uh, this person usually founds its startups, gets funded, moved to the Bay Area, everything is fine, doesn't develop anything, just talks about stuff. Uh, and this is not what I like to do. What I like to do is something more related to solving conflicts. And solving conflicts, I mean conflicts between me, a techie, and the business. Me, as a techie, how can I find, how can I fight this downward spiral? And what is the downward spiral that I'm in here? This term, it came around the same term that uh, when the DevOps started in 2008, 2009. It means that usually you as a product owner or you are a salesperson, you have to develop something, you have to build a feature, you have to sell something. You talk to a stakeholder, you talk to a potential client and you say, oh, we're going to build this for you and we're going to charge you this. You write your epics, you write your stories, you put things on Jira, or like the previous one said, if you don't need Jira, don't use it. I completely agree with that. Uh, you go into that direction, you write everything, the person is, uh, the development team starts building it, but they will find problems. They will hit blockages, they will hit walls, because that's what software development and IT is. It's not a clear path. You can have a direction, but you don't know what is happening on that direction. So they will start to face problems. You're going to miss some deadlines. You're going to have some issues. And what can you do to overcome that problem? Or you can be transparent and say, hey, this is what happened. We're trying to fix it, this blah, 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 blah. But the client may be unhappy, depending on how things are handled. Or you can put your leash up and say, like, we're going to do it. I don't matter how and why and when, because that's what we need to do then sometimes the development team has to cut corners. They have to add technical depth. They have to skip over things and they have to go over especially the operations team. Because the main conflict that we find on this situation as well is the development team wants to move fast. They want to develop things. They are not doing things because they are like, oh, I feel like I need to do this or move slower because it's going to be fun. Every, every developer wants to move fast because we are usually very curious people. But the people that actually need to deploy that into production, that need to keep it stable, that need to observe and that need to monitor, sometimes they don't want to move fast because when something goes wrong in the middle of the night, the pager that is going to beep is their pager, is not the developer pager. And this was the mindset until 2008, 2009, before DevOps. How do you keep these two contradictory goals of speed versus reliability without crashing into each other. So DevOps came to put them into a room uh, and to try to sort it out. Like, how can we move fast without having these problems? How can we move fast without low quality code? Without adding a lot of technical depth? without increasing the number, of out with the number of outages. And one of the things that I can tell you is that actually moving fast is the answer on itself. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but the fact that you break things, it will screw your life for one hour, one day, one minute, one week, but in the end, it will make your life easier. Moving fast is already the answer. You can check this amazing book called Accelerate. This book really, really goes into the data around this, why moving fast is better for developing better code and better products. So 
we have four problems by this fight between development and operations. And it's low, it's, it appeared as is one of the problems, but it's actually the cause of the other three, or it, there is a, a relation to it. And it has a lot to do with this. You're asking me what the hell does this have to do with anything. Uh, actually, technical depth and doing things at the same time without asking is exactly related to this. You are just repeating the same thing, hacking your way around, trying to do things for something that you, don't, you didn't even need to do at start, just because someone started doing it. Like, you don't need to keep doing things the way that you're supposed to be doing. You can find other ways to do things, and one of the answers to that is the most basic one. Build products. Think about products. Put development, product, IT operations, QA, and InfoSec in the same team and make them work together. Stop with the ticketing and the toil and the things that come with the traditional ITO mindset of how to do things in development. Of course, easier said than done. I've been doing this in different places, and surprise, surprise, culture is always the biggest problem. People don't want to change the way that they are doing things because it's working. I can hire a consultant, so I probably have extra revenue. So why the hell is this consultant telling me that I have to change everything? So what does this come with it? How can we change this? Again, the change doesn't come from an external consultant tells you how to do things. The change has to come with, within. People can try to ignite that, but it's a tricky one. Because the f one of the things that I see a lot, some of the problems that I see when I talk about s regular software development cycle and machine learning and AI things, is that for software development, we have evolved a lot in the last 10 years. Continuous integration, continuous deployment, we have infrastructure as a code, we have a lot of services, we have a lot of paths, we have a lot of better monitoring tools, and we can do a lot of more automated things. And even self-heal from problems. Machine learning, on the other hand, is on its infant steps yet. Why? Several, several, several reasons. One of them, nobody wants to be on call. Who here has a product that is 24-7? When something goes down, do you get called? One person? Who else? Two, three, four, okay. Uh, do your developers get called? One, a little bit, some of you. Do you do have first line of support, second line of support, and all of those things, right? So the first person that gets awake is usually first line of support, and then the operations and the data center team, right? Or something related to it. But the actual developer that build the code, he gets called after a long time. After like, you tried a lot of things, nothing is fixable anymore, let's put this guy on it, and I don't care what he's doing. And this is a big problem. Because what I do on my teams, and I lose developers into this, is that the developers are the first person on call. Because if they experience the pain of, of 3 a.m. receiving a PagerDuty message, or a VictorOps, or OpsGenie, or whatever message, they will start writing better code they will start writing better tests because they don't want to have their dinner interrupt, their sleep interrupt, their time with the family interrupt. And this, on machine learning, is even harder because usually these are built by data scientists and data science are very much academic mindset depending on the case. They want to work from nine to five or they want to do other stuff because they come from this background. The other thing with data science that is a lot unrelated to software engineering traditionally is explainability and ethics. You as a, uh, the majority of the developers, they get a user story. Build a button with this, with this, acceptance criteria, blah, 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 move on. Machine learning usually comes with a more broad business question. Can you answer this? Can you go into this direction? And they test different ways of doing it. So they have a lot more to say and a lot more to do 
into the kind of data that they look, the kind of relations that they do. Is it okay that I build a model that tells the likelihood of someone to default into a mortgage and put into account ethics, uh, ethnical things, or gender? It may generate more money or make it a better model, but is that an ethical decision? Or if I don't think it's ethical, should I whistleblow it? Should I pull the end on cord and say we're not doing it? Dealing with data and generating automatic decisions based on data with machine learning models raises a lot of questions for explainability and ethics. And it's something that we should not stay away from it. We, as people working in technology, have a lot of power in how the day-to-day -day of people's life are taken into account, and we should think about ethics all the time. Another thing, machine learning is very hard to measure efficacy. In a regular software development, if you think about it, how do you know if your new button or your new website or your new workflow is working? You can do A-B testing, you can check the number of uh, API calls, you can check the request minute, uh, the, the request time or the number of 500s, you can test a lot of stuff. But on machine learning, for example, you build a recommendation engine on an e-commerce website. How do you know if your engine is working? You cannot ask people, are you enjoying this, or are you going through this or not? You have to use proxy measures around it. Are people buying more? Are people buying the recommended things? I'm doing A-B testing with people that have this enabled and people that have this toggled off. So you always have to go around and how to measure efficacy of this. But especially, tags and image recognition, all this stuff, are really, really hard to measure efficacy because you don't know you made a mistake by default. If I take a picture of this room and say, tag this, and it says, church, because there's a lot of people sitting looking for a preacher, is that wrong? Yes, it is wrong, but how would you know unless you go in through every image? So it's really, really hard to measure efficacy for machine learning models. And another thing is, on the regular software development part, we already went away a little bit in local development. What do I mean about that is that that old excuse of it, doesn't, it, it does work on my laptop, it's not that much accepted anymore in software development. Even though now it switched to it works on a Docker container on my laptop, but let's not go into that direction. Uh, on machine learning, this is usually the case yet. Data science and machine learning engineers, they usually download CSVs and they do stuff, a lot of things locally, develop things locally and end up with a PPT presentation. This is what we've done, this is what we achieved, this is the model, run this on batch every week and you'll get your output file or whatever you want from it. This generates a lot of rework. So, all these problems, how can we fix them? First, there is no silver bullet. I wish I there was, I could make a lot of money on this and have more spare time. There's none. It's all about culture change again. It's all about new ways of working. And, of course, no one size fits all. What works for your company is not going to work for your company. What works for you is not going to work for him. And that is one of the things that I really, really try in my heart here in an Agile conference not to make fun of SAFE. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to make fun of SAFE. What? <laughs> well, uh, it's because I have some problems with this one-size-fits-all kind of mentality. Lean, agile, safe, Kanban, worldly maps, event, whatever, whatever it suits you. Take the best things of the best things that work with you and use them. Don't sell a one-size-fits-all. The first thing that I, that I usually say to everyone is, Build product teams for data science as well, for machine learning, for AI. Put the machine learning engineers and the data science in the same room as the operations people, because their job is not finished when they have a PPT. Their job is finished when they have it, a CI pipeline, a deployable artifact, 
uh, RESTful API or a gRPC, something that can be served and tracked and monitored and observed in production. That's when their job is considered done. But if something is running in production, it's never ending. It's your kid. You have to take care of it. So they have to monitor, they have to observe it, they have to own it. And again, I want to stress this out. Local data science is dead. Why local data science is dead? Besides the fact that I mentioned to you, something that happens a lot in companies that I go to. They have a teams of data scientists or one data science working in specific problems. I go there and I realize that they have, for example, one data science has been working in one project that project is one GitHub repository, and I look at it, and in three months, it has three commits. And I go into him, and it's like, well, what, what the hell? Like, uh, you've done this for three months? Uh, I don't want to mean that you're not doing anything, but uh, what is this? And then he said, like, no, 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 I've done a lot, but I just committed the models that work. But if you do this, and you leave the company, someone else will do the same error again. Build the same wrong model that you built. So I don't care if you have a 1% accuracy model. You don't need to deploy that into production. But that needs to be tracked and evaluated by everyone. That kind of transparency lacks a lot in machine learning. And one of the reasons that that happens is on the culture side. Why? Again. The majority of these data scientists and machine learning engineers, they have a background similar than I do. Math, physics, bioinformatics, blah, 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 masters, PhD, they are used to submitting a model or something into an into a actual publication, a scientific publication. And this is peer evaluated and very, very hardcore peer evaluated. That means that they are not used to subpar results. And what I have to explain to them is that the fact that that, does, that that goes into production, it's not your decision. That is a business decision. So if you build again a 20% accuracy model, a 50, a 100, the fact that that will roll out into production is a decision that has been taken by the team, by a business team, and by people working together. Does this day make sense or not? But the fact that you have 10 models that will not be rolled roll out into production, that doesn't mean that the rest of the people don't need to know about the existence of those models. And that has a lot to do with the fail culture, the safe culture, and the way that I have to tell them, I don't care if the model is good or not. I just want to avoid people to redoing the same thing that you're doing. And that comes a lot with this, CICD. Of course, machine learning and models has a lot to do with data. You have an input, you have hyperparameters and algorithms to tune into it, you have an output. You can have online processing, batch processing, whatever you want to call it, but they all have this kind of mindset. Input, hyperparameters, output. That means that traditional CI-CD, the one that we use for web applications, are not easily implemented here because the majority of these CICDs ML, they are what we call stateless. They don't need to like rerun for the historical data of a year or something. It, they just build on the, on the fly. So CICD for machine learning is a little bit tricky, but it can be done and people have to work on it. But more than CICD, continuous evaluation. You build a model. You have an artifact in the end that can be deployed as a Docker container in a Python flask or whatever. In the end of it, how do I know if I want to deploy that into production or not? Is it better than the model that I had before? Is it still, after that is running, is this still better than the one that I had before? Is it better than the one that I had one year ago? Do I have to retest? How do you compare different models and you continuously evaluate them? There are now open source tools for doing this, and this needs to be input into what I call the CE pipeline for machine learning, the continuous evaluation pipeline. And this is the tricky part. When we're doing regular software development, we have bugs all the time, as we do in machine learning, as we do everywhere. There is no such thing as bug-free code. <coughs> 
If we know that there are bugs, we can try to identify where the problem is. If you have a button that's not working for a specific browser, and you get a complaint about it, it's not working on Internet Explorer 5, because, I don't know, you want to give support to that. Uh, if that's not working, you can probably test it, fix the, that specific code, and make a bug fix, or a patch, or a hotfix, depending on the problem of that. Put that in your CI, CD, redeploy that. Straightforward. You can identify where that problem raises. On machine learning, it's not that simple. Again, if I take a picture of this and it says church, it, it is a bug in the general concept of a bug that we have for software. It is identifying this as a church when it's actually, it's not. Can I write a patch that will adjust for this specific picture? This bug, we cannot. You have to retrain your entire model and hope that this will be catched by your neural network or by your model or about something. But that means that something else that was working, it may be broken now. And things will break. We're talking about mathematical approaches to statistical learning. And they have implicit errors. And that's a different mindset. That is, when we're talking about machine learning models, we have not just a certainty that there will be bug. We, have a, we, ha we will have bugs always. You will never, never have a 100% accurate model. It's impossible. So, what are the bugs that we can try to sort it out, besides building better models and having better data? Three things. Bias, drift, and fragility. Bias is something related to this. Uh, Amazon started to filtering uh, CVs, and inadvertently, he saw that it favored male candidates. One thing about fake news around this story. This was released a few months ago, and everybody was bashing Amazon on this, sharing on stuff. First, Amazon never put this into production. So this was never actually an error. They found out while they were testing, and they released so people know about this kind of stuff, because they wrote a paper on this. And the most amazing thing about this is that gender was not a feature of the data set. So the deep learning model that they were using was actually identifying gender by other variables in the model and favoring male candidates. So, wow, how can we fix this? This is a problem on the data set itself. IT uh, is a very macho environment. It's a very, very, I think, 80 to 90%, depending on the company at least, is usually male. The more the back end you go, the more to IT infrastructure you go, even more, the more front end, more women. So, there are ways of identifying bias and stuff with mathematical methodologies into this, and there is a bunch of papers on this that we can share, but you can identify bias in your data set and try to avoid that beforehand, and that's what Amazon did. On the other hand, drift and fragility are a little bit trickier. Let us say that you have an e-commerce website. You never had a recommendation engine. You start having one now. You spend three months developing it, using a lot of data points, a lot of data sets, blah, blah, blah. And you start running this in production. After one week, two weeks, you start with a very, very good hit rate. Everything that you recommended, 50% people were buying it. Then it goes to 49, 48, it starts dropping. And you think like, what? Machine learning, things should become better with more data, right? The thing is, when you train for that historical data set that you have for one year or two years or three years, you didn't have a recommendation engine yet. So the features that you selected, how people interacted with it, were not yet influenced by the algorithm itself. So this meta thing of, I have a recommendation engine now, and this is influencing how people interact with it, changes the important features of the algorithm now. So my algorithm starts to drift, even though it has more data. That means that I have to select a new model, select new features. My model starts to drift from reality because he starts interacting with reality. This is a very hard concept. Yeah, yeah go on. Uh, 
Uh, so the question is, uh, how could you predict? No. Uh, maybe there is a uh, If uh, you could uh, add the logic in the first place that uh, my algorithm would uh, affect how people uh, iterate, so can uh, fix it beforehand. Yeah, so uh, the question on this is, we will never know exactly when that will start. You can, you can think about it. I'm having a new recommendation engine. It will start interacting in a different way. So maybe I need to change it. But when to do change it? After one day, one week, one hour, a month? So the goal here, and that's what I want to mention about Drift and Fragility, is about observing, monitoring. As soon as you start to see things dropping and getting worse, then you have to revisit, retrain, rebatch. So it's not about not knowing if that's going to happen. It is going to happen. Models will drift. Models will become more fragile. The point is, how do you observe it? And that's the most important part here. Is that OK? And fragility, on the other hand, is also similar to this, but it's not a drift on the sense itself. But it's, uh, let's say, you have a model that predicts uh, prices in a stock or something. And one of the most important things for you is GDP per capita, let's say. And your GDP per capita calculation of the United States change it because Trump decides that he wants to change it. How does your historical data set and your things will overcome those changes in uh, values and units and things around that model? Or you calculate prices with uh, VAT, VAT percentage changes. How will that affect your model? Did you take that into account before? So how fragile is your model to these external changes to the units that he's using? So one thing that is important is bias, like I said, we can try to avoid it and we can try to minimize it before the model goes into production. But drift and fragility, we don't know when to act unless we are monitoring, we are observing it. And that's what I tell about product teams. If somebody builds a machine learning model and steps away to do something else, he needs to be involved to maintain and to observe and to monitor it. It is a living organism. It needs to be monitored. So I talk about some things. And in software, in software development in general and in non-machine learning development, some things that I mention are like, yeah, have to make work more visible. For example, uh, we have to increase the speed, we have to make people learn, we have to reduce waste, we have to collaborate, we have to have a better fail culture, we have to have CICD and CE, the continuous evaluation part, and we have to observe. All of these things are foundational parameters based on some other more Agile project management and things to it. Talent management, the Toyota model, Agile, reliability culture and factors, Lean, the three ways from Elijah, distributed systems, and as a DevOps person, like DevOps movement person, this is what DevOps is bounded on. DevOps started mainly, mainly based on the three ways, Agile, Lean, and Toyota. And when it started in 2008 to 2009 with Patrick de Boa and all the people that actually started this movement, one of the things that they made it clear was it's not defined. There is no formal definition of DevOps. It should not be a formal definition of DevOps. It's not bounded. It's not development and our operations working together there is no need for DevSecOps, DevBizOps, DevAIOps, AIOps, or whatever. It is an evolving thing. It has no end state. That means this is not certifiable. There is no institute responsible for it. It's community driven. And that is the thing that me, as someone that organized DevOps Days Amsterdam, that did some other things, that work with people all over the world, what I try to sell is that DevOps is a cultural movement around collaboration, fail-safe culture, automation, continuous learning, and 
There is no end state here. We don't want to put an end state into it. And to end, AI development feels like software 10 years ago. Not a lot of automated things, a lot of batch processing things happening, a lot of people doing things on their local laptops here and there, a lot of heroism, like this guy that knows all about that system, doing that and making sure that things are working. It feels a lot like that. And one of the things that, help, that actually helped software development become better, in my opinion, were DevOps. So I've been trying to bring some of that mindset into the AI development as well. So I want to say thank you, because I don't want to be more in between you and lunch. And if I have any questions. Muito obrigado. We have time for two questions before we break out for lunch. I was told that this room will start lunch before the theater. So any questions? Or is everybody hungry? Hi, thanks for the talk. Did you have any problems persuading uh, uh, DevOps or sysadmin guys to sit in the same room with the product, to, to the same team, the product team? And if yes, how did you tackle it? Yes, uh, I've had a problem with sysadmin sitting in the same room, with QA, with uh, product owners sitting in the room, with uh, InfoSec. Uh, yeah, people sometimes don't want to sit in the rooms with, 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 with other ones. And I always come to them and I ask, uh, what is your work and uh, what, is, what, is, what, is, what is the end goal of your uh, work? What do you do in, in the end of the day? And if he says, I should keep these things running, I say like, no, 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 no. What does your company do? Oh, my company builds that and that. Okay, and how does your job relate to that? And I keep trying to put them into the overall flow of how their day-to-day -day job contributes to generate more money in the end, and then putting how, they, how he can interact with other people into it. Because this, usually this kind of uh, mindset that you see a lot on sys admins is a lot, a lot related to the box mindset. This is my role, this is my responsibility, and I try to broaden that up. Sometimes it doesn't work. In the majority of the time, it doesn't work. If people do not want to move on, that's, it's a hard decision to make, but sometimes uh, I just tell people, yeah, this person is not going to contribute for your company on the long term, so it's your decision to if you want to stay with that person or not. But I always try to be transparent with the person. Like, if they keep with this mindset, they will have a job for one, two, three years, or when until the next uh, uh, crisis come, but who knows? It's all about our mindset. Does that answer a bit? Yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. Yeah. Um, you said before about uh, the problems in the CICD in a, a male environment, machine learning, because I guess there is many data involved. So if you want to, you know, create a, an environment that is production-like, for example, to test your assumptions then you have to deal with data. Do you have any examples or patterns that you have used to tackle this problem with copying the same data, or how, how, how do you do that? But uh, it depends on the model that you are using. Some models are online models that, that we call, and they work with uh, deltas. So when you have a new data, you can select, like, retrain this model every month, every year, every minute, every second, up to you. There are a very, very few number of online models that actually work well. So the majority of them are still batch made. So when we do a CI CD on this case, we don't roll that into production automatically. We have a deployable artifact in the end. So we run, maybe the model may take five minutes, maybe it can take three days to actually run. When that is finished, we have that deployable artifact somewhere, and then we generate a load of uh, tests into it. And then with that same load of tests, we can compare it to the model that was built before or earlier or something else. But uh, it requires some uh, good fine tuning of your CICD pipeline. Transferring the data all over it, there is no actual need for it because you can train the model against the same data set every time, everywhere. You just try to bring the computation closer to the data instead of the other way around. Because as you say, data has a lot of gravity and moving it, it around is quite expensive. So. We try to do the other way around. 
Right. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. So there's no continuous deployment. Basically, you break the pipeline in two. The one, the one has to do with the software, the one that has to do with the evaluation, and when that is good, then you merge it again into production. I can do a continuous uh, deployment but it will just be a long-term continuous deployment okay, yeah. because the batch model needs to run for three hours or to three days. Yeah. After that is finished, you have a deployment artifact. I can deploy that, but I think that this kind of models are better evaluated by someone and actually do A-B testing and things like, like uh, that than actually going into production and continuously deploying all the time. But it's the question that I give to people, like, do you really need continuous deployment or do you need... Uh, continuous deliverable artifact. And that is a, a distinction that I like to make with people. Uh, if you are building a, a Adobe Photoshop, let's say you have 200 developers working on it. If every time that somebody commits something, you get an update on your laptop, you would be upset. Mm. So continuous uh, delivery and continuous deployment are two different things that I like to stress out here. Yeah. I'm thinking in terms, of, in terms of the continuous evaluation of the inducer or the classifier or the data. Oh, yeah. So the continuous ev evaluation should always be happening, and you can have a tracking server to see, like, okay, this new model that was committed by this person with this model, these hyperparameters, based on our test set, had uh, accuracy and F score, this metrics. The one that we did two days ago had this metrics, but it has been running on production for two days with this metrics. Run this over to production, continue to monitor these metrics. Compared in both, oh, this is going better in production, even though it went worse on test. Roll this out for other ones. So all this pipeline is a little bit hard to make, but it's feasible. Yeah, thanks. And one last question from Xanthi P. Hello. Um, I would like to ask you something regarding this uh, fragility stuff you mentioned before. Um, is there any chance that if we spend, you know, very much effort on building our model that we decrease um, the extent of fragility, or should we approach this by, in terms of, you know, fail fast? Well, um, I think there is always a thin line there about the fail fast. That is, uh, fail fast does not mean do not think about your problem and just go with it uh, heads on. But I also do not think that spending days and weeks planning something that you actually don't know how it's going to be in production, because that's how machine learning does. Like, you can test as much as you want, but production is a different wonderland, I would say. So if you have a proper observability platform and you can look at how things are going, I think it's better to be able to act fast on that and to retrain things and even to roll back and say, like, we don't have a recommendation engine anymore or something like that if things are completely, completely blessed off. But I think it's a, a thin line to, to make. And, yeah, it's case by case and the, the kind of variables that you have and the kind of models. Uh, it's a trick question to have. Uh, I don't have a one-size-fits-all for this as well. Yeah. Great, thank you. A big round of applause to Thiago. Muito obrigada, Tiago.